Okay, um, welcome back. So uh, let's go right ahead uh, to Dr. Lawrence Olumide, who is the president of uh, National Association of Proprietors of Private Schools, NAPS, Ogun State Chapter. He joins us via Zoom this morning. Good morning, Dr. Olumide, and thank you for joining us today on the program. So, um, yes, so much talk about this. The government at the moment say that they have met with different stakeholders, including NAPS, as to what they need to do to ensure schools get back on the July date. So tell us, what is going on at this time? What went on about that conversation? Well, good morning. Uh, if I, I understand that uh, question very well, you see, because of where we found ourselves in the country today and the uh, agitation that school should be reopened, considering the fact that we don't know when COVID-19 will leave Nigeria or the world. Because we cannot afford to remain static, life must move on. So there came guidelines to be used in ensuring that our children will be safe when they return back to school. New knowledge about COVID-19 has shown that regular hand wash, the use of face masks, maintaining social distance, and the rest can help in the curb of COVID-19. So we spoke and we said, look, if this is the new normal, can we test run the educational system by allowing the terminal classes to sit for their examination to reduce the level of depression they are going through because the anticipation of the student prior the advent of COVID-19 was that they would have finished their O-level examination maximum first week in July, maximum, maximum. And now, when we have that in place, it will give us opportunity to actually see if the educational system is truly ready to, you know, to combat or to continue to open school to allow children to learn by observing all the guidelines that can ensure zero transmission of COVID-19. Okay, now we understand your association was in that meeting from the statements, uh, the comments out there by the Minister of State for Education. How did you all agree on the July 29th date, which is just nine days away? July what? July 29, that's the date that we understand was agreed upon. Are you aware of that, July yes. 29? Yes, there was an initial pronouncement because, you know, why came out and said uh, the West African Examination Council with comments on August 4. And that, 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 that pronouncement you know, brought about the fact that, okay, school will resume because there is a pronouncement from WAIC that WAIC will commence on August 4. Now, we cannot just allow the student to resume back to school and then start writing exam almost immediately. So there was this request that, look, if WAIC will start by August 4, let there be at least some few weeks prior to the commencement of that exam for the teachers to be able to go through some level of revision with the students. That was the, that was the position of NAPS, that it is not ideal. It is not good. These students have been away, they have been out of school. Some of them have been in the marketplaces. Some have been at home without even anybody to guide them in their conduct of uh, you know, uh, study. So the, 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 the pronouncement from the minister thereafter that it's, it's possible that students may not write work this year obviously was like a bomb to those students and then the, their handlers that have started putting up structures and infrastructures in place to give them support in the course of the examination. So our association returned to the drawboard to say, look, if these students are not allowed to write this exam, now we are, we are destroying their morale, we are dampening their, 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 their enthusiasm and the interest to... To, to education is being affected here. This is our position that look, as a professional, 
When a child has anticipation, there is a vision, there is, there, 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 there is a projection that at so 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 time, at so so time, I will do so 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 and so. If I am not able to do so and so at so so time, then it will fall back on me to say, look, is there anything wrong with me or is something wrong with the system? Now, we are fighting for the interest of the child because the psychology of the child is equally important. Even if you make the announcement today now that, look, let school resume tomorrow, let the students start to write their examination, I can assure you that the teachers will have hell of work to do. We have to reconfigure the mindset of the student. We have to reposition them again to fall in love with their studies and their education. So this is the position of our association, and we have been clamoring, we have been saying this, that look, in the interest of the child, well, the point now is this. Will COVID-19 leave Nigeria today? We don't have the answer. Will it leave next week? We don't have the answer. Will it leave next week? I mean, next year? We don't have the answer. Two years' time? We don't have the answer. Three years' time? We don't have the answer. If other sector of the economy... The, the, can the, be issue, the issue here that uh, my colleague asked uh, is just to clarify, first of all, if you are aware and ready for the July 19 date that was pronounced by the Minister of State for Education. Of course! Of course, we are now, one of the, just one concern. moment, just just one moment. One of the requirements, according to the guidelines released by the Federal Ministry of Education, is that uh, school resumption form that uh, all schools are supposed to fill. Are you aware of that? And how many of your members have filled that form or can meet the deadline before you know of filling that form and sending to the Federal Ministry of Education before they can be allowed to reopen? Well, you see, you, you, you we, here, I don't know who is playing, who is playing game. I have not seen any form from any government in Ogun State. I don't know if uh, other states have seen that. If the government actually wants this to happen, if the government is proactive, they know what to do. How can you tell me that I should fill a form within the time space and that form has not been made available to me? But are you aware, Mr. Lumidia, are you aware of the uh, federal government guidelines for schools to reopen? That uh, document that was that 52 page document that is titled Guidelines for Schools and Learning Facilities Reopening After COVID 19 Pandemic Closures. Are you aware of that document? Yes. Yes, I'm aware. The, the, the Annex A in that document is the second or third to the last page. It has that, that, um, that form. And it is what the, the Minister of State said when he said that schools will need to self-assess themselves and confirm whether or not they are safe to reopen. Yes. So, I, the, the, of that form, the have question you... Now, the, go on, go I ahead. I've seen it, but the question now is, do we have this form made available to school owners? Do we have this form made available even to private, to public schools owned by the same government? They are just talking about it. The government should come out and point to so 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 and so school that this form has been made available to. That is the point. Uh, has is the there been? Ready? Okay, because I mean, the, the Southwest states have said that they will vigorously enforce the COVID 19 protocols as schools resume such that uh, students will not be in danger. So, one would have assumed has there been any meeting? between the state government, education ministry, and maybe NAPS and other schools as well? Yes, in, in Ogu State, in Ogu State the, the government constituted a 15-man committee to look into the guidelines of which I happen to be a privileged member. That was the only opportunity I had to see the guidelines. And then the first meeting we had was the last. So we are, we believe that uh, government is doing something about it. So if government, you see, the point here is this, there are political statements and there are, there are political wills. If there are political statements that is not backed up with action, then we are deceiving ourselves. Why should the government be deceiving us when they are not even ready? They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the instrument to say, okay, you want us to assess ourselves and see if our school will be safe for children to return. And then the same form that is meant for this same assessment are not available. I are we even sure that upon the completion of this same assessment form, government will look into it to consider that so, so, so and so school is safe for children to, 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 to return back to school? So, it, 
It's quite After that first that meeting, which you say is only one and last meeting that you've held, has there been any notice whatsoever about any other meeting that is going to hold? Yes, there was a there was a there, there was a notice that uh, there will be training in Ogu State for school owners, for school principals. Okay, the, the meeting, the, the training has been organized by the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Health. By that schedule, to start today with public school principals, and by tomorrow, private school owners, and then next tomorrow, private school principals. Yesterday afternoon, this training was called off. We received a notice that the training meant to prepare us for resumption had been suspended indefinitely. So, what are we talking about? Any reason? I don't know. Maybe I will know today. No reason has been advanced to that. This will tell you that the government is not actually prepared for reopening of schools. It's obvious. Okay, now... That's one. Secondly, so if government is not prepared, how about the schools themselves? Now, if you look at some of those guidelines, the highlights of those which were circulated, some of them were on the screen a while ago. One of them indicated that uh, water, provision of water in schools and ensuring that that is a constant feature. Is your school, for instance, up for that? Can you take your child to a school without a source of water? There is no private school in Ogun State that is government approved that has no good source of water. In my own school, by the special grace of God, I have more than four boroughs. Servicing the need of the school because we cannot afford to live and to have students without access to water. Water is life. If the government schools, if they do not have access to water, that does not mean private schools do not have access to water. Before your school will be given approval by government, the Ministry of Health will come to inspect your school and inspect your source of water. So all private schools in Ogu State approved by the same government, they have good source of water. By my understanding, you can set up an independent body to go around and visit school to see for yourself that we mean what we are saying. If there is any school that is not having good source of water, I doubt if such a school has government approval. And I'm sure Ogun State government will not approve any school without good source of water. So they have given approval to all schools that are capable, that have been able to satisfy the requirements of the, of the Ministry of Education and that of government in the establishment of private schools in Ogun State. Well, the thing is that there are schools that don't have those facilities. And as a matter of fact, it's not just the private schools that will be considered to reopen several other schools so it's a holistic action that they will take so we're hoping that one action or inaction of one school doesn't affect all the others so we're hoping that that doesn't happen how do you plan to enforce social distancing in your school as well this is why this is why i said earlier we should ask the government if we have public school at this age in this nation without wholesome source of water. It calls for concern. Be it private or public, it calls for concern. We should ask ourselves question. How can government establish a school? How can government give approval for a private individual to operate a school without good source of water? Now, the question, uh, at, Mr. Lumide, Dr. Lumide, just one moment. The question he asked is, for example, because one of the challenges that people have had is maintaining social distancing, even for the adults, the, you know, the full-grown adults. But we're talking up now about your school. One of the guidelines, one of the requirements is to ensure safe distancing, uh, uh, safe physical distancing between, you know, the students in the schools. What's the plan for that in your own school, for instance? All right, very good. By the special grace of God, my school is 26 years old. Paragon International School, Abekuta. If you come to the school pre-COVID-19 era, the minimum student we have in a class in our school is 24. Because it is a structural school. It is a pre-planned school. 
given approval by government. The sitting arrangement in our classroom is a student to a table. So if you are looking at maintaining social distance, pre-COVID-19 era, majority of private schools, standard private school had been operating through this standard. There is no good private school where you will have more than where you will have more than 24 students in a class. And then don't forget that the measurement of a class as given by government is in meters. I think 12, 12, 12, that is 12, I can't really remember now, in the likelihood of 24 feet to 18 feet, the, 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 the size of a good and a moderate classroom. So in the public schools, they use something like this, but in the public school, we use a modernized plastic table where you have a table and a seat. Okay. Now, given that, you know, let's say that is a given, but it is one thing for them to sit properly and maintain that di distancing. How about when they are not in class? How do they comport themselves? What's the plan to ensure that these children maintain this safe distancing among themselves when they are not sitting in a particular class, when they are, you know, playing around in school? Because I don't know how you'll be able to manage for students not to play together when they're in school, even if it's just the exit classes. As we speak, the children have been playing at home. Go to the streets. They have been playing together. They have been mingling up and down, play football, do all sorts. They go to the street to go and hawk. Some of them are already doing, um, what do you call it? This um, uh, join man, join man job, what have you. Now, you see, the, the function of the school is to keep educating the child. We are not even sure when COVID-19 will leave us. Why can't we start to begin to educate the child on how to live with COVID-19 in case COVID-19 will not be living soon? So a school is a place where we will be giving them information. We will be giving them instruction on how to live. Okay, well, it looks as if uh, some <laughs> one, one button had just been touched. And so... Uh, it's, it's to continue to educate our children. Uh, we, we lost you for a bit there, but let me just ask you this question, uh, Dr. Rumili. Um, what challenges, what kind of challenges do you foresee as an association um, when the schools finally resume, even if it's just for these, uh, you know, um, exit classes as we have been talking about? What kind of challenges do you foresee and what's the plan to take, charge, to take care of them? Yeah, number one is... Uh, 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 the, 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 the children that have abandoned their education for a while will be facing with the challenge of, you know, restoring them, reconfiguring them back to, to the school system. I can, I, I can tell you authoritatively here that there is a distortion in the learning process of these children. And then the mindset of these children have shifted from their academics. So as a professional in this field, we first of all want to restore them we want to welcome them back and assure them that they are safe and that we assure them that it is time for them to abandon the days of wandering. They have wandered away. Of course, they have wandered away. So we have to bring their minds back into their, into their learning activities. That is going to be a challenge because some of them now, they have started making money on the streets and that money is put onto them. And then for them now to begin to to return back to their studies will be a brief challenge. Now, another challenge we have is that the, the, the morale of our teachers has been, has been dampened. The morale of teachers that have not been paid salary for the past two months, three months in some instances, is already affected because they are hungry. Now, they believe that the nation they serve through education cannot get stuff for them at a time like this. It's a serious matter. So, assuming the schools, your school, were to reopen if the government allows all of those. How many students are you expecting back? Well, in my school, I register 52 students for WAIC. And I have facility, my school has facility to accommodate 650 students. So a facility of 650 students will only be used by 52 students. That is what we're talking about here in my situation. 
Okay, the, the, that, did that take into cognizance provision of the COVID-19 referral centers? Of course, at a large scale. Because before COVID-19, at every block, there is access for students to access water. We have points where students will wash, wash their hands regularly. So this is, in my own okay, case, I have an oversized facility for education. An oversized facility for education. And I believe this is applicable to majority of school owners that knows their son, that, that knows their onion. What is your thinking about school fees payments? Are they going to pay because there's that conversation that's been going around now, whether or not they should pay uh, fees, what percentage should they pay, how should they be coordinated? It's, it's, it, that's, a, that's a different topic entirely. We are, what we are talking about there is that we are, we are more concerned of the education of the child. The, 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 the age of the child cannot wait. The growing up of the child cannot stop. All right? The, the appropriate skill to be, to, 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 to be infused into a child for a particular age is vital, is key to their development. And when you skip this portion, then you, you end up producing a maleducated adult. So the issue of money is not the it's not key. The, it's not the issue of money that is key. It's not the issue of money that is more important now. We are talking of the future because we don't know when COVID-19 will leave us. So let's begin to learn how to live with it in case it's not leaving us soon. So I'm not particularly paying net of school fees. I'm particular about the education of the child. Particular about the safety of the child as well. Dr. Olumide, I'm not sure that's the way some teachers, some private school teachers feel. They feel that money for them is also very, very important. As you would know, many of them also have school fees to pay, uh, children to feed and all of that. So when you say, some of them listening to you now, when you say that money is not so important, they are asking questions in their mind, don't you think? Well, to, to every business, to every business, there, is, there must be a source of revenue to keep the system running. All right? Now, I am not ruling out the fact that money is essential. But what we are saying, what our association is saying, our teachers are suffering. Some of us too, our life has been affected, our means of livelihood, yes, but that is not our primary reason for agitating that the education of the child must not stop permanently. There must be a way out around it. When that is restored, then we can come to a, a, a round table with a parent to begin to say, okay, now that we have our children back to school, how do we fund the system? How do we fund the school? That is what is ideal as far as I'm concerned. And as I can assure you, the majority of us in Ogu State we share this same sentiment. I am not ruling out the fact that there are school owners who may take that as priority. Well, individual differences, but the education of the child is more key, more critical to us than that money. We live on the money from the parents, but at a time like this, we have to look into what benefits the nation than what benefits individuals. Mm. Well, it's good to know that money is not the chief concern for you or for your school as well. But just give us some more, uh, a moment. We'll come back and get uh, your concluding thoughts and other perspective on this matter as well. Do stay with us. Welcome back to Sunrise Daily. Well, just before we get back to our conversation on the schools, the protocols that need to be adhered to before they reopen. They've got a July, uh, July 19 date. But July 24 is an equally important date which you need to mark on your calendar if you are in Lagos or if you happen to or plan to make use of the third mainland bridge, for instance. That's because that is going to be short. You know, they're going to swap, maintain, uh, ultimately, for six months, we understand. Well, we've got our correspondent, Olo Phillips, who is right there, right now, to bring us uh, up to date on what is going on now. Good morning, Olu. So tell us. What's happening? What's the thinking? What have you found as we prepare for this July 24th date? Uh, hi, Chamberlain, and good morning to you, you and Aya, and good morning to Lagos. So, um, 
today is Monday, and in four days' time, approximately uh, Friday, the bridge will be partially shut. Now, I'm backing the um, inward into Lagos Island. So in front of me is Yanowuru. Behind me is Lagos Island. Now, this is the protocol. 11.55 um, p.m. every day up to 11.55 a.m. Those going into Lagos, that's the ones going this way, uh, will have access to the bridge. Now, all the way this way, and this side will be shot all the way from Adeniji. The repairs will start inward Yanowuru. So this is the side of the bridge to my right, inward Yanowuru, outward Lagos Island, that will be shot partially for repairs. So the repairs will start on my right. And what that means is that as soon as it is 12 noon every day, um, you can't come onto this bridge anymore. So those coming from the island will now have to come over this lane and drive all the way as if they're driving against traffic. Now, what that simply means is that if you're coming from Ojojubega, um, you're coming from Ikorodu, you're coming from anywhere along this axis, once it is 12 noon, you can't have access to the bridge if you're going to the island because you have to make way for those who are coming. Unlike what we had in 2009 and 2012, where at some point there will be a diversion on the bridge, there will be no diversion in between the bridge. When you are going to the island from 12, from 11.55 p.m. previous day up to 11.55 a.m. the next day, you can use this bridge into the island. And if you are coming out once it is noon, you can no longer use this bridge. You have to use uh, what authorities have decided to call the alternative routes. Um, these are just routes that are available and heavily challenged, Chamberlain. Well, we understand that uh, there have been several concerns about those alternative routes. But tell us, have you heard anything about those officials who are supposed to work together to divert traffic? How ready did they say they are? Let's be clear on one thing. Um, traffic control is so, will be effective. Traffic control is effective when, of course, you have um, alternatives where you have myriads of opportunities and arteries and road arteries. It makes the job more easier. But I think what will happen is that all of the traffic shop runs will have to just continue to shop run people along the axis of just two available exits from the mainland into the island. And that's talking about Ikorodu Road and the Herbert Macaulay Road, which will lead you through the Kata Bridge. But all of these places are narrow gauge areas and heavily um, commuter areas, especially if you're getting around the Ebutero area and the Butemeta area, rather, where you have a lot of congestion and have a lot of um, uh, buses picking up and dropping passengers. Those are the kind of things we want to see uh, to make sure that there is a control of these yellow buses, the big buses, and all of that. And when you come to Ikorodu Road, as you travel down after Fadei, get it into barracks and get it into stadium, it becomes a slow pace because the, the Eco Bridge is closed down, the entrance into the Eco Bridge is closed down for repairs. And sadly, as it were, that bridge will not be opened for another three to four months. So we have about two, three major bridges in Lagos that are under simultaneous construction or reconstruction. Third Mellon Bridge maintenance, Eco Bridge maintenance. Then you see the spillover of um, trucks and articulated trucks at the Orilla axis. That's a spillover from their proper end. And Chamberlain, what the authorities didn't also tell us is that they have also shut down partially the marine beach in Apapa. So you see, um, trucks, articulated vehicles going into Apapa from the Orilla axis and other areas converging into Apapa um, are having a slow movement because the marine beach has been shut partially for, for repairs. A co bridge shut partially for repairs. Stop Milan Bridge to join suits this Friday. I, I, I don't know how the traffic shop runs are going to do this, but it's really going to be um, a bit of a challenging time and a convincing time for commuters and for motorists. Uh, Olu, uh, this is Ayo. Um, one of the, on the one hand, I mean, we, we've had this kind of case in Lagos when authorities make promises to the people about as to how uh, these things, the chaperones, the, the traffic chaperones that you've talked about, are going to conduct themselves, saying that it's going to be smooth and easy and all of that. But on the other hand, is that of the user experience, the people who are going to be on the roads? From your findings, because I know you've had this conversation with road users, you know, for a bit, from what you have observed, 
How confident do you think the people are about the kind of experience that they are going to have, you know, using these roads in the next uh, few months? It's, it's the word of the commuters against that of um, the traffic um, chaperones and traffic superintendents. What we have not seen is that synergy and belief that it's going to be a worthwhile experience. I don't know what that disconnect is, but I know that some of and most of the people we have spoken to, the commuters, are not so confident that this will move smoothly. And, and the reasons are very simple. There are too many craters on the road. There are too many bad roads on the road. Uh, bad portions and, and so much in terms of um, traffic control. You see uh, yellow buses driving on the highway, stopping and picking up passengers. No deterrence, no punishment, no arrest. All of these have a way of slowing down your travel time. And you wake up and you see all of this happen. It, it seems like the commuters are not carried along, as it were, especially those who really want to obey traffic, who really want to drive decently, who really want to use the road the way it should be used. They are not getting that opportunity opportunity rather but this is hoping that at this point uh these superintendents of traffic and everyone in federal safety the lasma and every other uh, personnel that will be deployed will have um a kind of synergy with road users and and increase that kind of confidence that allows for motoring experience that is one thing we will be looking out and looking out for uh during this period it's going to be a long long haul i must tell you ayo six months they are hoping that they can finish before six months but before this will be over it will be january 2021 my brother well that's that's definitely not very pleasant news that many people uh, would like to hear if uh, if possible people want it to be done with within, within record time but then we also understand that uh, there are moves being made by the authorities to fix uh, certain of these uh, alternative routes that you've mentioned. Uh, do you see those being ready before the set date or do you see a possibility that the closure might be postponed for a little bit? I, I do not want to sound pessimistic, but the truth is uh, it will be a huge, huge miracle to see all of these alternative routes or roads that really existed to carry people from the mainland into the island to be fixed before four days. I don't know how that is going to happen. The my two access under the bridge is terribly bad. What we have is um, damaged road because of blocked drains. Uh, blocked drains and the silting happening when the rains are here. Uh, the really end of um, Igomu Bridge or the beginning of Igomu Bridge is flooded because the drainages are blocked. It's yet to be fully desilted and the surface of the road has weird out completely you come to the um to, to the uh what's it called the korodu the korodu road axis uh, you have to make from four six lanes into two lanes approach the um what's it called approach fusha williams make a roundabout under the gomu bridge before start heading to a co uh joining the co bridge again and other ancillary roads um agege motor road is completely out completely destroyed not possible now if you're coming from alagba do agege all of those areas you want to go to the island your journey should just take you all the way through that agege motor road straight through mushi straight to challenge up to stadium as and you go but you can't do that anymore because that portion of the road between mushi and um Idio road is completely bad owing to drainage problems blocked drains no desilting, the, the roads have been damaged. And you ask yourself these questions. We see these roads, we see these drainages um, get blocked. We don't desilt them on time. What programs do we have to make sure that periodically these things are done? And when you see them desilt, funny enough, when you see them desilt, they bring out these debris and put it by the side of the road. Most of them are on the side of the road. As soon as the rains come, they wash back. This has been a recurrent decimal in what we see in governance especially in this part of the world, and you begin to wonder when will all of this come to an end and we begin to really live a mega life in a mega city. Well, as a matter of fact, Olu, uh, don't forget, <coughs> Ikorodu Road as well, uh, the Ojota end, some work, some construction and rehabilitation is being done there, and then some parts of Ujora, they're also doing some work on some of those roads. So it's going to be challenging, really. But... Is there any conversation? Did you hear, have they spoken about 
how they need to advise motorists in terms of, because those who will want to make use of these alternative routes, there will be people who will not be so used to the roads, they may miss their way. So will traffic managers be lenient on the road users who perhaps, as a result of not knowing the road, miss the way, and then hoping last mile will not come very hard on those motorists? Anything in that regard? Chamberlain, if you're driving in Lagos, please don't miss your way. Be sure of where you want to go. Be sure of the routes. Be sure of the alternatives. I don't know if you. I don't know how many people really know how to navigate their, self, their, their way around Lagos if one road is not motorable, for instance, or it's not usable. For instance, if you get to the foot of the Third Milan Bridge and you're coming all the way from Moway Bafo, Bega Axis, and you hit the beginning of the Third Milan Bridge at about five minutes after. 12 in the afternoon or 12 noon you have to make a right turn because you can't use the bridge now it, it, that will slow you down because you you wouldn't have known that by 12 it would to be shot so that slowing down will have a tailback i don't know what the traffic superintendents will be doing with people to make sure that as that time approaches they begin to conduct them to go to the right travel all the way through bagada get to antony take the ramp and get back into Ikorodu road I do not know, I do not see, but I'm hoping to see that um, traffic superintendents will be very cordial with road users, knowing that a bit of your life will be disrupted, not just in, in a small way, in a big way. I'm aware that corporates on the island, um, institutions on the island are having several meetings um, because most of their staff live on the mainland. The airports are on the mainland. Businesses are beginning to open up in Lagos and um, very soon, the other parts of um, businesses that have not signed on to opening will open and we are not on lockdown anymore. So businesses are picking up. People will have to travel from the mainland to the island. All we want to see is traffic people smiling, making sure that people give them a smile and motorists you to uh, try and obey traffic signs. Let all see how we can go through this challenging time for the next six months and see how it works. But what I want to see again is a, a constant review, a constant a fortnightly review, a one-week review of all of the people that need to be involved. Let these agencies get their best foot forward, get their best men on the ground, get the, be get the best boots on the ground and make sure that it's going to be a wonderful synergy between the contractors, the motorists and the traffic superintendents. All right, then. So what a time it will be, January 2021, next year. But thank you very much indeed, uh, Olu Phillips. Thank you for your reporting today. So there you go. You need to do stuff. Uh, just look at the calendar. Look at the roads. Use the maps. Whatever information you need, you need to get a lot of it because I tell you, you'll need it. All right, let's get back to this conversation now. Uh, Dr. Holumide uh, talking to us about preparation for resumption of schools, meeting up with those uh, guidelines, the protocols that they have agreed with the Ministry of Education to allow graduating students get back to school to take YEC. Well, Dr. Holumide, you were talking about um, how money is not the chief consideration. Uh, good to know that. But... Could you then tell us, um, yes, we, we, we heard you say that, but in terms of percentage, there will still be some fees. Parents need to plan. People need to plan some of these things to know what to expect moving forward. So in the event that the schools are back, what will the thinking be? What should they prepare their minds for regarding school fees payment? Well, uh, why, why are we talking? We are talking about this issue because the government had failed us. The, the, the COVID 19 had made it possible for us to know that in Nigeria we are on our own. The, the teachers that have been teaching in private schools are payers of payee. School owners pay money into the covers of government in the name of taxes, expecting that at a time like this, you know, we have support from the government you have been paying taxes to. 
Now, it is unfortunate that neither the school owners nor the teachers in the private sector had been helped. We therefore ask of what value as our commitment to the Project Nigeria in the payment and remission of our taxes to us. If government had risen to the occasion by supporting private concern, putting money forward at a time like this should be secondary. I still strongly believe that money is not the primary reason why we should agitate for the opening of schools. Whether from parents, because don't forget that the same parents we are talking about are equally been affected by this same COVID-19. Some of their businesses are closed down. Some of them even working in the public sector are yet to receive salary for the month of June. So if we open back schools today, and then you now want to force those parents to pay the money they don't have, it is not fair. This is why I would want to challenge every of our leaders to think and look far into the future. Let us look beyond now. What of if we have a situation where we cannot even go out, out of our out of our respective buildings for six months? That the situation is so critical that look, this thing is airborne. That once you leave your inside of your house, you are you are you are you have contact you have contacted this the, the, the disease. That means all we all die for nothing. So it okay, is just, time just... for our beyond today to see when we have a situation like this in the future, how can we protect the, 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 our citizens? All right, George, hold, hold on a minute. Let's bring in uh, Yomi Farime. He is a consultant uh, for that particular sector, the education sector. Good morning, Mr. Farime. Thank you for joining us today on the program. Now, uh, the ministry, they're talking to stakeholders, giving them this July date such that uh, they will prepare to reopen, having spoken to some countries. They say they've spoken to about four countries on a green what to do with WAEC moving forward. So you've looked at this yourself. Do you think that uh, they've taken sufficient measures now to prepare and not put the students in harm's way upon resumption? Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a privilege and also appreciate uh, being here today. Um, I think one thing we need to first ask ourselves is what exactly is all of this about? Um, is the goal for our children to go and write an exam or to go and learn? Because I really don't understand where the balance of the argument is. The universities have been shut down. Our universities are not operating because of COVID. So if you are rushing students to go and write WAEC, those students are supposed to go to those universities that are shut down. So why are you rushing students to go to a school that is going to be shut down? And then we've had arguments around, oh, the school are there. The question we need to ask ourselves is that we know our health capacity. Do we need to deceive ourselves uh, that things are not bad? We know our health capacity. There are state government, for example, a couple of months that all COVID um, uh, people that are affected by COVID were kept in hospitals. But, for example, the Commissioner for Health in Lagos said that shouted a long time ago to say they didn't have capacity. And if the numbers kept growing at that number, they were going to have um, excess capacity. And they had to change strategy just because the number kept growing. How do you deal with growing number of cases? And that's when you now feel it's appropriate to take students to school. There are a couple of things we need to be very concerned about. So there's a lot of talk from school owners and school proprietors saying, our schools are ready. Question to ask is, those students are going to commute to school public sector analysis and solution finding is to look at the whole value chain. So assuming the school is safe, and we know the schools are not safe, we know those schools, in a normal situation, they are not safe. Assuming the schools were safe, right, how would that child get from his house to the school? It's something we need to also factor in. There are children that stay in Alagbole, Akute, and school in Ikeja. They take two bikes and take a bus to get to work. We just heard today about closure of a part of the Todd Milan Bridge. How will those children cope with that? How will the teachers commute to work and the people that support the school system? So it's not just about the schools are ready. It's about the whole value chain. And let me ask a question. 
The private school owners are saying their schools are ready, but we know that the majority of our students are in the public schools. We know that for a fact. Based on data from WAEC, over 20,000 schools will be writing WAEC in Nigeria. 20,000 schools. If you do the maths, the number of people that have been involved in logistics, carrying scripts, um, supervision, invigilation, lab assistants, lecturers, teachers, chief invigilators that have been involved. I did a calculation and I saw that we're going to likely have an excess of between 501 million adults involved in that process in Nigeria, moving around, supervising schools. You know, sometimes the person that comes to supervise physics is not the person that comes to supervise geography, is not the person that comes to supervise home economics. So you're going to have teachers in a place like, the invigilators in a place like Lagos moving around and going around. Who has assured or looked at this, the, 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 the movement to be sure that they can do that safely? I think just analyzing this by saying my school or our schools are safe, it just doesn't talk about the whole picture. We are not ready. There is no point we're taking a risk to send children to schools that is just the right exam. I understand if it's to learn, but not just because of an exam, to go to universities that are locked up. Document put out by the Federal Ministry of Education. I don't know if you have seen that. Well, let me hope that you have seen the that document and probably even gone through the 52 pages. Are you saying that that document does not capture the entire value chain of education and consequently needs to be reviewed? <laughs> you know the point say about that document? The document says the schools should uh, do uh, get themselves prepared and do a self-assessment and send the result of the self-assessment to the Ministry of Education. Question. Which school is doing those self-assessments? Is it the schools that we know? We know we know our schools. We don't need to deceive ourselves. Is it the public schools that we know the capacity of the school in terms of, are they the ones going to do the self-assessment? We're going to be relying on opening on schools based on self-assessment of some people that already have vested interest on why the school should be opened. Um, the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics came out with a report last week on what Nigerians are, how Nigerians are responding and handling to the COVID situation. And one of the findings was the fact that one of the areas where Nigerians struggled the most to be able to keep themselves, well, respect all the rules of social distancing in terms of regularly washing of water of their hands and using soap to wash their hands. And the major reason that was given in that report, the report is available with the public, was because people could not afford soap. Those are parents with their children at home that could not afford so. How do you now want to say a public school will be able to have that ready? So I've looked at those provisions. I've looked at the guidelines. They look safe. They look like it can take us to an extent. But, you know, the challenge is that most of those guidelines are similar to the ones you have seen in other countries. Now, in those other countries, those schools were safe. They are just making them safer for covid in our own situation, our public schools were not safe. We were in this country where children were abducted from schools. We were in this country when uh, the, the former Prime Minister of England set, started the initiative on safe school projects. Our schools are not safe before COVID. So using therapies that have made schools that were safe to become safer, we not help on safe school become safer. That's just a point. The gap is so wide. We have schools that don't have fences. So one of the things there is that, okay, these schools should start to think about having provision to be able to test students on a daily basis for their temperature. How do you test students every day for the temperature of a school that doesn't have a fence? When some students come from the south, some come from the north, some come from the east, and some come from the west. How do you check temperature every day? How do you ensure that there is adequate um, water supply in those schools? Finally, and this is also to the private school, because quite a number of the private schools are really talking a lot about the fact that they are ready and they are prepared. And the question to ask is, how do you know you are prepared? You, you, you did some things and you concluded. A single child can cause a problem for you. The bigger challenge is that, okay, so one school ahead, the school provider was saying that what they were going to do is that they're going to ensure that their children wear the face masks and they're also going to ensure they have the face shield. And I just asked a very simple question. I said, are there air conditioners in your school? He said, yes. I said, and you're sure that that is good for your children who are uh, asthmatic? Because in that okay. same class that you say you have an air conditioner, you have asthmatic children. 
Are they going to All right, be wearing we, we, shields and face masks? All right, we, we do thank you for those thoughts. So those are important considerations that we all need to take on board, the stakeholders inclusive, if we need to meet up with that deadline. So we thank you both, uh, Yomi Farimi, Education and Human Resources Consultant, as well as the Dr. Uh, Lawrence Holomide, who is the President, National Association of Private School Proprietors of Nigeria, Ogun State Chapter. Thank you both for talking to us this morning. Welcome back to Sunrise Daily. Well, all eyes will be on the House of Reps Committee investigating the NDDC's activities today. Well, now we've got Dr. Chris Akia, who is a former president of uh, IYC. He joins us via Zoom as well today. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Well, yes, there'll be a lot of focus on this NDDC probe, but it's been on for a while, and uh, yeah, you may have you know, been reading and uh, have some perspectives on this matter. So could you tell us, look, what's your thinking about how all of this is playing out, affecting the region eventually, ultimately? Uh, good morning, Chamberlain, and thank you for linking me up. Um, I guess everybody in the Niger Delta will be at a loss and perplexed as at what we're seeing. And clearly, I think that um, the government needs to redirect the kind of capacities it wants to put in the Niger Delta area to solve our problems. Uh, um, over the years, perhaps we. Oh dear, we seem to be. Was there. Okay. Our people want to siphon money for them uh, to become governors and all of that. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Go ahead. We can now. Good. good. So the siphon money for their own gains are at the expense of the people. In the last six years, that agency has not been able to do anything meaningful to add value uh, to the system. Already before then, we complained that um, they're not doing enough. They're corrupt and they need to be censored and looked into. But the recent happenings... Uh, it's just a clear indication that the way and manner people are appointed to this agency need to be reviewed. Our people need to have an input in it, and people who are concerned about the region need to head those agencies so we can have value for, for, for the money that has been spent there. Money going into the agency is enough to that. I can tell you clearly that I was looking at the list of contractors paid. Most of those roads are not in existence anywhere. The camera's back has been broken. This is a time where the government needs to look at this so-called forensic audit and review the approach to make sure that accountability is achieved in that entity. So otherwise, it's a pipe drain. I'm excited to let you know also that the Joy Council are just transmuted and there's a new president. We will things that don't and the right people are given chances to lead our region. That's the kind of thing we will do. We no longer allow to just be struggling with it. We want to take responsibility of the agencies that are supposed to be able to cater for our people. We want to ask questions and we don't care if these are our own people. We will ask them questions and we'll stop them from siphoning our money going forward. Where do you think this House Committee or National Assembly's probe on activities, I mean, short-term activities of NDDC, how do we avoid this being a circus? Okay, yeah, that's been the case, you know, it's um, counter accusations and accusations. So when the National Assembly tries to ask questions about what's happening in NDDC, the NDDC quickly turns around and say, look, you guys are asking questions because we didn't give you jobs. And that's how the country runs. Uh, for every investigation of this nature, this kind of thing will happen. But it should not take away the fact that the, the element of truth, it's, um, it's there. It's clearly there that there's misappropriation. So let the House, the Joint Committee, do what they need to do, put whatever they want to put in the public space, then let the people work on it and the appropriate investigative agencies, the EFCC, the ICPC, the, and, and then the, the NFU, all those organizations, then get into those information and help put in the Nigerian space and in the Nigerian system the truth about what has happened. Now, the NDDC also have a right to, <coughs> excuse me, 
to go to court or report any corrupt member of the committee who then so know and access um, access funds or contracts and have not done so. And also the right agencies can go after those people because they do not have immunity. But we should not water down what the, the House of Reps and Senate are trying to do about finding out why 81.9 billion of our money will disappear or will be spread and shared in pockets of private individuals uh, within this short period. We're not talking about 20 years. We're talking about a couple of months. And I'm wondering what, what they want to do with this kind of primitive accumulation of wealth. And what is more painful is that these are supposed to be the best of the pairs. The, the MD is a medical doctor, a professor for that matter. The EDP is also a medical doctor. It, and they should know that life is very important. The people need to have good roads, good water, good health system, and they don't care. So for me, we are where we need to ask questions, and the House of Reps is in the right direction. Now, working out of the House of Reps, our the committee is also in itself in subordination. The law has a position for that, and I think they should invoke it totally. Otherwise, um, people will begin to get away with it. You invite committee um, uh, agencies or MDAs to the House to investigate the walkaway on, on the House. So the House must enforce its powers as provided by the law. The other day, the Honorary Minister for um, Labor, I mean, um, Kiamu, Minister, what about, uh, came out and then said um, he had issues with them and he left. Recently now, um, the MD of NDC has done the same thing. So before you know, it becomes a pattern. People come to the House and walk away. We can't take that. Well, uh, one of the things that you mentioned the other time is actually quite troubling, the fact that some of the projects on the list or, you know, claim to have been done or being done um, within the Niger Delta region. Some of them do not exist anywhere. And it brings, raised a question in my mind that successive administrations have come under fire, intense you know, criticism by Nigerians for not developing the Niger Delta. And there we have the Niger Delta Development Commission that is supposed to be doing that. Now, Niger Delta Development Commission has successively been led by citizens, indigents of the Niger Delta. Shouldn't we be asking questions? Because a researcher told us that the, all of this ruckus that's been going on in the NDDC dates back since almost the beginning of the NDDC. Shouldn't we be asking questions of, shouldn't Niger Delta indigents be asking questions of their own people who have headed this uh, you know, agency, this commission, over the years, or is there something that Nigerians don't understand? Yeah, exactly what I said. I said, luckily, uh, I'm just returning from the creek where we just better the new um, leadership of the Joy Youth Council. And um, part of our focus is to bring pressure again to the region and to the government about doing justice to our region. Because the little games we had between 1998 and early 2015 seem like they have been eroded slowly by a deliberate attempt by the people who have occupied offices that represent our region. So in the Niger Delta Ministry, for instance, between 2015 and now, I don't know what they've been doing in the budget because the only project, only major project that they have on that ministry is the East-West Road. It is in bad shape in a state of disrepair. You can't really move too far from on that road. The sections that have been done are getting broken down and it's very uh, upsetting. And then the end of the thing itself keep getting releases from the government. Year in, year out, and all we get to see is board of directors fighting themselves over how to share money, accusing one another, they sack one agent, uh, the board, they bring another board. It's the same thing. And then they talk about water hyacinth. Do you know water hyacinth is, um, is, 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 is a scam? And they spent $40 billion to, to distilled and clear water hyacinth from what uh, Joining was saying. $40 billion could do a whole lot of piling work and dredging work in our region for communities that are been eroded away. And this it does not get involved. And the last time they did the reclamation work was very clear and those people are happy about it. But they continue to collect money for this thing. So we are going to take action. We will mobilize and we will encourage our youths now because I'm already over that age. But we'll encourage right, our youths right. now to see until the right people are appointed amongst our people to deal with this. A problem from where you stand with how management committees or heads of the commission are appointed for the NDDC? Do you want to take that again? I, I didn't get to hear you. I said, Sorry. is there 
from where you stand, from your own opinion, from your own perspective, is there a problem with how management is recruited for the NDDC, for which we are having this problem? Yeah, clearly, clearly. Most, uh, uh, oftentimes, actually, my, uh, board members are appointed for the purpose of political gratification instead of for the purpose of delivering a goal, unlike other clients. So if an agency of the nature is created to serve a purpose, you want to look at people who have capacity, who are true and sincere, so government can actually achieve its goal. But what we're seeing over the period is clear. I work for a party or a system, and then I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. I get my name on the list. As soon as it gets on the board, I begin to service those networks. So all these monies that you see back and forth, when then there's a conspiracy, kickbacks and, and settling of one another and all of that. So once they start settling those who have appointed them, they, they are emboldened to also steal their own share of the money. So until we break that cycle, the good intention of Mr. President to support. Right, one more thing, Chris. Uh, you what? know, the, the, sorry to jump in. The, the NDDC Act stipulates in Section 7, Sub 3, that in carrying out its functions, the uh, commission shall be subject to the direction and guidance of the president. So do you expect the president to do, take any major step other than the forensic audit which they've asked to be done? Yeah, I think right now <clears throat> that, board, that IMC needs to be sacked first. They cannot preside over uh, the forensic audit. As I speak with you, we do not know what agency. Is it Pricewater? Is it uh, Deloitte? Is it KMPG? What, what international audit firm or local audit firm that's doing the auditing? And this is over like a year since we're talking about forensic audits. Nothing has happened. And why they are talking about auditing it, the people who are supposed to preside over the, the auditing agency are themselves culpable of corruption, even higher than the one that they are probably going to audit. So I think that a substantive board needs to be in place and a line be clearly drawn for the board to kick his and uh, put his feet on the ground running while whatever had happened prior to the appointment of the board is now audited you can't stop existing because you want to audit the agency as i speak to you if you take away the ndc away from the Niger Delta, you cannot find any federal government project that is meaningful uh that uh, i mean in terms of road in terms of healthcare, that is in the Niger Delta. so the ndc is like a lifeline even in terms of economic development and capacity building for small businessmen in the region. In the last two years, all that has been, have been, have been put on hold. So the, the, the president needs to appoint a substantive board, a, a, a firm board that is well supervised directly from the presidency. Because even the way the Minister of Nigeria is going about it is an illegality. All right, yes, Mr. The act that established the NDC do provide powers for the Minister of Nigeria to supervise that agency. All right, it, it's, a, it's a conversation that we'll keep tabs on. Uh, we do thank you for your thoughts as well this morning. Chris Aki, you're a former president of IYC. Well, let's head to the National Assembly. We've got uh, correspondent Terry Kumi, who is on hand. Uh, good morning, Terry. Now, the thing is, first tell us, do we have a confirmation that session is still going to go ahead and hold today? What are you hearing? Okay, Hello, Terry. Can you hear me? Go ahead. To hear from you as well. Absolutely, that session will go on this morning at 11 a.m. As a matter of fact, there's some increased security. Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. All right. Yes. Yeah, so, as I said, that section session will actually go on this morning. As a matter of fact, there's increased security around the uh, National Assembly. Just before you get into the National Assembly, there's some increased presence of security. Uh, men there and uh, we understand that uh, most likely the NDDC acting MD will join this meeting we don't know whether via uh, electronic or uh, in person and it's same as uh, Senator Gautula Kwabu, the Minister of the Niger Delta. That's going to be a tricky one because they, they asked him to appear so I'm not sure did they tell him no you can't appear by electronic means or otherwise but we'll wait and see what eventually happens. But the dailies are reporting this morning that uh, the NDDC's IMC, they're heading for a showdown with the committee over uh, Tunji Ojo. They don't know if uh, members are even wondering, should he step down? Shouldn't he step down? 
Is there any conversation, maybe, you know, the backstory from any member about what may happen to the leadership of that committee? Do you hear anything? I strongly doubt that that will happen. Uh, I say that because uh, the last time the acting MDDC, um, the NDDC MD appeared before the committee and raised that argument, the committee uh, decided to pass a vote of confidence on Olubumi uh, Ojo as chairman. Uh, they say that it's a personal matter and if he has any grounds, he should go to the court, but that is not going to happen. So most likely, I don't see that happen. I can almost say certainly that Olubumi Tinjojo will preside over the hearing today. And as you said, it's most likely going to be a showdown. Also, the speaker did say that there is no way that the House of Representatives or the National Assembly will allow its image to be tarnished by anyone. So whatever accusations will not stop this hearing. I don't know if I should take you to um, some of the things that the lawmakers will be responding to today. One of them is the forensic audit, which I heard you speaking to your guest about. Just to remind you that that forensic audit uh, is what the president is relying on to, jump, to make his conclusions. And you recall that uh, former M MD of NDDC, Joy Nunez, did say that there was no forensic audit going on. So most likely, the outcome of the investigative hearing conducted by the National Assembly would play a huge role in how the president responds to the, um, the uh, activities in the Niger Delta Development Commission. All right, then. Thank you very much indeed, Harry, and we'll keep tabs with you on the matter as it progresses. So there you go. Uh, we're back in a moment. Join us again. All right. Welcome back. Let's take a look at some comments uh, coming through from you. We've got, uh, well, Professor is back again on this one. Uh, he says, UK that I know of uh, has agreed that final year students that ought to be writing GCSEs be appraised with their mock exams taken earlier for university admissions. We must be careful in Nigeria not to open the already ajar door wide open, he says, to this pandemic. Mm. Well, Ibrahim J says there's a technical and technological way to open schools, at least for the final year students, to write the exams. That's the, the WASC. Show us the way. Well, <laughs> I, have to ask <laughs> I guess that's a big question. <laughs> oh. Go on. For me, at Jibode, yes, Femi Ajibode says opening schools should be carefully done to prevent an outburst. I think he means an outbreak among pupils. However, the, e the economic effects on teachers should also be factored into any decision taken. And then we've got uh, Olayo Lady says developed economies that opened up are now shutting down again due to increase in infection rates. I feel for teachers in private schools, but we can't expose children this early. Why not wait till we really know more about this virus before opening schools? David Obaro says, it's just unfortunate the way the issue of resumption is being done in Nigeria. I brought my son to school in Nigeria from the UK, but unfortunately, the purpose has been defeated. This is just do what is right and let schools reopen with appropriate guidelines in place. Mm. And this one is about Third Mainland Bridge sympathies with Lagos people. Uh, Femi Ajibode again says, the proposed closure isn't going to be easy for road users, but however, it's better to get the right thing done than to experience a national calamity. Says kudos to government on this. Uh, Sharon Raji says, well, my church is currently engaging our teens on graphic designs and computer programming to add new skills. Parents should look inward while the government should get palliatives to all schools, teachers in the country. He says, I think they seriously need it. <laughs> so there you go. That is it today. Thank you all for watching and keep your comments coming through. We appreciate them. We'll see you again here tomorrow. I'm Chamberlain Usa. I'm Ayo Makinde. Do have a wonderful day and please stay safe. And I'll say be responsible out there. Do the right thing. Thank you for watching. I'm Mao Yusuf.